Hi, this is Peter from Anatomy Zone. This video is the first in a new series we'll be producing on clinical conditions and their anatomical and pathological correlates. We will be taking a look in this video at the structure of the coronavirus responsible for the current pandemic and how its structure causes its clinical manifestation. Coronaviruses are a large family of common viruses which are found in humans and animals. Many cases of the common cold are due to a coronavirus. They have caused two large-scale outbreaks in the past two decades, the SARS virus in 2002 and the MERS virus in 2012. It's generally been considered that these coronaviruses could cause future disease outbreaks because they're known to be able to evolve within animals and then jump to humans via an intermediate host. In SARS, palm civets and raccoon dogs were identified as the intermediate. COVID-19 is an example of this, which is believed to have jumped from bats to pangolins to humans in a local seafood market in Wuhan, China during 2019. COVID-19 refers to the coronavirus infectious disease found in 2019. The actual disease itself is referred to as COVID-19, but the virus is called the SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, and was named because its structure very closely resembles that of the SARS virus from 2002. This is the seventh known coronavirus to infect humans, two of which were similarly highly pathogenic, MERS and SARS. The other four are of low pathogenicity and endemic in humans. Let's now take a look at the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So looking at this virus, we can see that it has a series of protein spikes on its surface, which when viewed under a microscope, appear like a crown, which gives rise to the name corona, which is Latin for crown and is therefore common to all the coronaviruses. There are four structural proteins, which is similar to other coronaviruses. The S, the E, the M, and the N proteins. The S stands for spike, the E stands for envelope, the M stands for membrane, and the N stands for nucleocapsid. So let's take a look at these different structural proteins in turn. Beginning with this crown-like structure, which is the S or spike protein. This protein is responsible for allowing the virus to attach to the membrane of the host cell. It contains a receptor binding domain which recognizes a specific receptor, the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2, which is expressed in the lungs, heart, kidneys, and intestines. It has been shown that this protein binds to the ACE2 receptor with at least the same affinity and potentially as much as 20 times greater affinity than the SARS virus. This could be one of the explanations for the reasons why it's spreading so easily. The spike protein itself has two functional subunits. S1 binds to the host cell receptor and S2 mediates the fusion of the viral and cellular membranes. Because of the critical role this protein plays in binding to target cells and cellular entry, it is a particular focus in the design of vaccinations and medical treatments for COVID-19. Let's take a look at the next protein, the M or membrane protein. The membrane protein is the most abundant on the viral surface and defines the shape of the viral envelope. It can be thought of as the central organiser for coronavirus assembly and interacts with the other structural proteins. Moving on to the E or envelope protein. This is the smallest of the major structural proteins on the viral membrane, which appears to have several roles. We know that it is integral in the assembly and release of the virus from host cells and during viral replication, it is largely localised at the site of intracellular trafficking, more specifically at the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. So essentially, the M and E proteins play a critical role in turning the host cell apparatus into workshops where the virus and our own cells work together to make new viral particles. Underneath the surface proteins, we have the viral envelope. This is the virus's outer layer, that is derived from the host's cell membrane, so our cells or the animals. It's a fatty layer and worth noting that in contact with soap, it will break down, killing the virus. 
And this is the reason why hand washing with soap is so important to prevent the spread of this virus. Underneath this layer is what's called the capsid. This is a protein shell that encloses the genetic material of the virus. Inside this capsid, we have the nucleocapsid, or N protein. This protein is bound to the virus's single strand of RNA, which is where all its genetic information is held to allow itself to replicate. The N protein appears to be multifunctional. In particular, it essentially inhibits a lot of the host cell's defense mechanisms and assists the viral RNA in replicating itself and therefore in creating new viral particles. So we've looked now at some of the important structural features of the SARS coronavirus 2. A lot of our understanding of the pathogenesis of COVID-19 comes from work on the original SARS virus. Because the viral structures and morphology are so similar, there is likely to be significant crossover in the biochemical interactions and pathogenesis. Let's now look a little more at how the virus infects humans. So the virus is spread mainly by respiratory droplets, i.e. a cough or sneeze, which aerosolizes the virus, allowing it to travel into our nasal or oral cavities. We also know that it can live on surfaces for hours and even up to a few days on some surfaces. So if you touch an infected surface, it's very easy to then touch your own face and inoculate the mucous membranes in your eyes, mouth or nose with the virus. Initially it can get into the upper airway, so the nasal or throat area, and this is why you can get those symptoms like a common cold, stuffy nose, headache, sore throat and fever. It is within the mucosal epithelium of the upper respiratory tract where primary viral replication is thought to occur. Similar to SARS, SARS coronavirus 2 is able to get further into our respiratory system and into our lung epithelial cells where further viral replication occurs. Let's talk a little bit more about the ACE2 receptor interaction. The SARS coronavirus 2 binds via its spike or S protein to the ACE2 receptor. This mechanism of binding is the same way that the SARS virus was able to bind to airway epithelial cells. The host cell has proteases, which are enzymes that break down proteins, and these cleave the spike protein. We think that this process activates the protein in order to trigger the process of membrane fusion before injecting the viral genome into the host cell. A similar mechanism of protein cleaving facilitates cell entry in influenza, as well as this mechanism of direct cellular entry, the virus may also enter the cell via endocytosis. This is the process by which material enters a cell after being surrounded by an area of the cell membrane, which then buds off inside the cell to form a vesicle. Once inside the cell, virus-specific RNA and proteins are synthesized within the cytoplasm. Further viral proteins are then assembled with the blueprint of information contained within the viral RNA, using the host's cellular machinery, specifically the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, with specific processes to form the envelope glycoproteins. New virions are then assembled by fusing to the plasma membranes and released as vesicles via the cellular exocytic secretory processes. So the stresses placed on our own cells by viral infection and the interaction of our own immune system with the viral antigens presented by the infected host cells lead to cell death. During this process of cell death, multiple inflammatory mediators are released, which creates an inflammatory response, leading to a buildup of mucus and thickening and hyperplasia of the cells within our airways. This inflammation causes irritation of the cells lining our airways, which leads to the cough, Let's move further down into the lower respiratory tract now and see how the virus acts within the lungs. So to get there, let's take a look at the path that the virus might take. So looking at the trachea or the windpipe, this branches into left and right main bronchi. These bronchi branch into lobar bronchi. We have three on the right and two on the left. And these then branch into segmental bronchi. The segmental bronchi branch into bronchioles, which terminate as respiratory bronchioles, at the end of which are the alveoli. The alveoli are the tiny air-filled pockets responsible for gas exchange. We have around 600 million of these alveoli, and they are responsible for exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and the air we breathe in. 
Due to the direct action of the virus, and also due to our own immune system's response to viral infection, the alveolar walls can become inflamed and thickened, and fill the alveolus with fluid, which can impair their ability to exchange gases, and this can lead to the symptom of shortness of breath. In some people, this process of cellular infection by the SARS-CoV-2 virus can lead to an exaggerated immune response with a huge release of pro-inflammatory mediators, causing what is known as a cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome. Cytokines are small proteins involved in cell signaling and are crucial in mediating immune responses. This cascade of inflammatory mediators causes an uncontrolled systemic inflammatory response, which leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. This is the rapid and widespread inflammation in the lungs, which causes the epithelial and endothelial cells of the lungs to secrete inflammatory mediators, which fill the alveoli. In addition, these inflammatory signaling cells recruit other cells of the immune system into the alveoli, which further contributes to and amplifies the problem. Further, the systemic inflammatory state causes increased capillary permeability, which results in even more fluid entering the alveoli. So essentially, this is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema compounding the problem. Overall, this pathological process severely impairs the ability of the lungs to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, as it's now become filled with fluid and inflammatory infiltrate. In cases of severe ARDS, invasive mechanical ventilation is required to adequately oxygenate the body. So that's what underpins the pathology at the extreme end of the spectrum. In the large majority of cases of COVID-19 infection, the disease follows a mild course as the virus is eliminated via normal immune processes. We will finish by taking a brief look at typical imaging findings. A chest radiograph may be normal in early disease, but when findings are present, will typically demonstrate bilateral, peripheral and basal airspace opacities. Pleural effusions are rarely seen in COVID-19 infection. On CT, as seen on these axial and coronal slices, typical findings are lower lobe predominant bilateral subpleural ground glass density opacities. While these findings are frequently seen in COVID positive patients, these are not specific. The differential for these appearances includes other viral pneumonias, interstitial lung diseases such as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and atypical bacterial pneumonias. So that completes this video on the structure and pathogenesis of the SARS-CoV-2 virus.